Hello, you're watching Talking Europe. My guest is one of France's most respected diplomats. Philippe Etienne was the French ambassador to the United States from 2019 until last year, ambassador to Germany from 2014 to 2017, and France's permanent representative to the European Union. He played a key role during the Russia-Georgia War in 2008, honing his crisis management skills, which clearly didn't go unnoticed because years later he was tapped as the French president's diplomatic advisor. Well, he now leads a project for the Ministry of the Armed Forces, which is organizing various commemorations marking historical events such as the D-Day landings and the liberation of France. Uh, Philippe Etienne, thank you for being our guest. Thank you for your invitation and for your presentation. <laughs> You're welcome. At some somewhat exaggerated. But <laughs> You're so modest, which is what everyone, your colleagues say about you. Um, should we start with the UK election results? Result, this landslide victory for Labour, what's your reaction? Oh, I don't think it is a surprise uh, because it, it, it corresponds to the polls and, uh, and uh, we will see now how the new Prime Minister will uh, uh, engage uh, in maybe more uh, uh, appeased relations with the European Union. We know that the Conservatives were marked by those this Brexit uh, story, but it is even their own divisions and the consequences, which were far from being uh, all positive of the of the Brexit for the United Kingdom and the British economy and the British people. So now it will be probably easier to to establish a, a this this more uh, more more constructive relation, uh, including uh, at a time where the United Kingdom and the European Union and its country, its member states face. Uh, common challenges, real big challenges, uh, of course, in foreign and security policy and, and security and defense is an obvious uh, field for a, a cooperation uh, with the invasion of Ukraine and other challenges. But there are other common uh, challenges such as uh, in artificial intelligence, uh, climate, and I, I am sure that uh, I'm, I'm convinced that this, uh, these are really uh, topics where the UK and the EU uh, will have to engage together more, more, still more closely. <laughs> Let's move on to some EU matters. Uh, we've had this visit by Prime Minister Viktor Orban, uh, whose country has just taken up the rotating presidency of the EU. He's been to Kiev and then to Moscow, at that second part of the visit, of course, being the most controversial in the EU. And he insists that peace will be the cornerstone of the Hungarian EU presidency. What do you make of all that? Well, you know, since the uh, Treaty of Lisbon, uh, the rotating presidency doesn't chair anymore neither the European Council, the summit, the leaders' summit, nor the Foreign Affairs and uh, Defence Council of Ministers. Who both have a stable presidency. Uh, Charles Michel, Josep Borrell for the time being, and, and then the successors. So. Uh, it is not like before this treaty where the rotating presidency uh, had, chairing all these uh, bodies had uh, more leverage. So it's, it's mostly political and uh, it will not change the position of the, uh, of the European Union and uh, of most European Union member states. We must try for a, a, a peace which is uh, um, acceptable to, to Ukraine and which respects the principles of uh, international law and uh, uh, including and in particular the sovereignty <laughs> of uh, all countries. So as a former French diplomat in Moscow, uh, you think this idea of peace is it's really for the birds? Everybody wants peace, uh, of course. And uh, I think my country, our president has a... Uh, has, uh, before even the, the beginning of the war, has really tried very hard to uh, to prevent this war, and uh, uh, even with with his ideas. But uh, what what we see now is that uh, Ukraine defends its territory, the population of Ukraine defends its freedom, and uh, uh, facing a, a brutal aggression. So, as I said, the peace, any peace, uh, should respect uh, the rights of Ukraine and its people, and and be. Uh, the, the result of a, a real um, uh, negotiation respecting uh, uh, not being imposed 
on Ukraine. Do you think the EU, though, will at the very least be distracted by these kind of Orban initiatives when it's supposed to be focusing on the strategic agenda in the next six months? We'll see how Hungary plays its role as rotating presidency, chairing the other Council of Ministers. Uh, the Hungarian government affirmed that it will play its role as a uh, presidency, honest broker, and um, uh, we'll see. I, I think that it is in no interest of any country having the rotating presidency to um, uh, abuse of this role. Every every country having the rotating presidency tries to to uh, to present its own views, but in a way which is respectful of its role of a rotating presidency. Uh, so we can hope that Hungary uh, will see its interest is in doing the same. What they have said, they have said they will do that. They will behave uh, as a, a, a genuine presidency, having in view the interest of the collective interest of the European Union. We'll see. You are, of course, a former ambassador to the United States, and one term which you hear elites in Europe talk about is Trump proofing the European Union. So this is the idea that uh, the EU has to stand on its, on its own feet. And basically, uh, the EU has, what, perhaps half a year to achieve this before Trump potentially comes back. Do you think this Trump proofing is actually happening? I think that uh, uh, I'm used to say that whoever is president in the United States and whoever is in power and uh, uh, whoever is, has a majority in the US Congress, the Europeans face their own tasks and they have to do their own uh, job. And uh, of course, the task will be different and uh, more difficult if uh, Donald Trump comes back to the White House. But uh, the own needs of the Europeans remain the same. Of course, we don't do anything, everything in six months, but uh, just take the uh, very difficult uh, and very important challenge of building a European defence. Uh, we have not started uh, yesterday. Uh, we have been embarking uh, on this journey uh, since uh, already four, five, six years with new instruments, new budgets, still very, very small compared to the needs. but. We have to continue and to accelerate on this way to have a more uh, independent Europe, which doesn't mean we are not in the Atlantic Alliance. We need this alliance. We are not, as far as the US uh, government is in favor of it, we keep a very close relation with the US. We close a very close alliance, but we have to to do our own job, we have our own tasks as Europeans. Um, Ambassador Etienne, you're obviously being very diplomatic, as one would expect. You're saying a Trump presidency would be different. You're admitting that. Uh, but, you know, privately, uh, I guess some of your colleagues in the EU might be using stronger language on that. I mean, there's a real worry about his possible return, isn't there? But, of course, there are worries when you see first uh, the Trump administration uh, between two, 2016 to, 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 to 2020, and it's uh, augmentation through what uh, the candidate Trump says today on, 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 on the two issues of multilateralism, you know, uh, uh, which would be uh, neglected uh, in, fa in favor of a, a sheer bilateralism, transaction transactionalism. Yeah. And the second issue uh, I think of as a s subject uh, where we can be worried is trade, because uh, Donald Trump announced that he would very much uh, rely on tariffs for towards China in particular, but also towards anybody. And as we have seen when he was president, uh, without uh, making any difference because between the allies of the United States and other countries. So trade would be more difficult because if if he if he became becomes president again and he does what he has announced then we would have a a, a big big uh, difficulties in trade and all in all the subjects we have seen uh, a couple of years ago digital services and uh, uh, taxes and uh, all those issues which are already very contested by the Trump administration you obviously still have great contacts in the United States. And I'm just wondering what they're telling you about where the presidential race is going at the moment and whether 
the time is sort of really running out for uh, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, as uh, as a, as a candidate now. You see, uh, reading the press, that the conversation uh, runs uh, very quickly inside the, among the Democrats, and. Um, I have no other information that what uh, you and I can read in the press, where President Biden says he stays in the race, but he, he also said, indeed, uh, my debate was a, a bad one. And uh, we'll see uh, very rapidly whether his new uh, appearances, his new uh, uh, participation in the, in the public debate, interviews, uh, electoral campaign will... Uh, correct the, view, the negative impression which was created during this debate. There must be a cut-off point that if, if things start going wrong in September, then it's really late to change candidates, isn't it, at that point? Anyway, there is a convention of the, uh, the Democrats hold their convention in Chicago in the middle of August. So it's a time where, uh, and, and some people technically say they have, if they take any decision, uh, they have to take it uh, even before the convention for, uh, you know, uh, technicalities. We'll have to end it there. Thank you so much for being my guest, Ambassador Philippe Etienne, former French ambassador to the United States. That's all for this episode of uh, Talking Europe. But in the second part, you can watch our debate about China and the EU and where that whole debate on tariffs is going.